I want it now and I ain't never gonna back down. Hello, I'm Bryant McFadden and welcome to The Rise. How do players become Hall of Famers? What did they do as kids to help them get on the field and be successful? Who helped them along the way to realize their dream of not only playing in the pros, but also leave the game as one of the all-time greats? How about we ask an individual that was able to accomplish all of those things? That individual is here with me right now, James Lofton. James, how are you doing? Welcome to The Rise. And how is sunny California treating you? Sunny California is treating me great. The weather out here is always excellent, as everybody knows. And uh, I'm looking forward to the program and kind of going through my memory banks to kind of see if I can remember some of these things that I went through as a kid. When you think about your bio, so many accomplishments you've been able to accomplish throughout your life. First and foremost, you were born in Fort Ard, California. You played quarterback, safety, kicker, and punter at George Washington High School in LA. Played wide receiver at Stanford from the years 1974 to 1977. In 1977, James, you were a second team All-American and an academic All-American as well. He also was a three-time track and field All-American. He was the sixth overall pick to the Green Bay Packers, played 16 magnificent seasons with Green Bay, the Raiders, Buffalo, LA Rams, and Philadelphia. And their crowning achievement inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame in 2003. You know, it, it's funny because when you look at yourself, you remember kind of the plays you didn't make or things that were quirky about your bio that people might not know. So when I hear you and I hear you talking about when I was a collegiate football player my senior year, second team All-American, I played one snap on defense and I had an interception, got mm -hmm. knocked out of bounds. And then in track and field, my senior year, I won the long jump, but I also qualified for the NC2A meet because you had to qualify on times in the 100, the 200, and the 400. So four individual events, which has never, which at the time had never been done before. Uh, you were born in Fort Ard, California, but you, you know, you were raised in L.A. You, you moved to Los Angeles in, in the third grade. Uh, talk about your family, your siblings and growing up in L.A. at that time. I had an older brother and uh, he was seven years older than me and sisters who were six and five years older than me. Uh, my older brother was a, a really good athlete and we went to the game and he was the captain and I mean that was you know he went out for the coin toss and then he was on the field for every play he played linebacker and he played tight end I can even go back to when I got my first Pop Warner uniform I came home from practice he took me out in the front yard and he said get down in your stance and he got down opposite me and the next thing I remember I was on the sofa. He's going, don't tell dad. Don't tell dad. He had knocked me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you don't remember the hit. You just remember laying no, on the sofa. Exactly. I just remember being, you know, waking up and him going, don't tell dad. Outside of the game of football, were there any other, you know, interests in other sports in your household? I played football, baseball, basketball, and then there was a track program for about four weeks in the middle of the summer at, at my park. And it, the park is now mm -hmm. called Jesse Owens Park, but at the time it was Sportsman's Park. And, you know, if you grew up in a the neighborhood, there's always a kid who's the best athlete in the neighborhood. And that was not me. Down the street, my best friend, Carl Mosier, is better than me in football, basketball, baseball, and track. When, when we got together and we played one-on-one -on -one in my backyard in basketball, I would be Will Chamberlain and he would be Bill Russell. We all know Bill Russell won, what, 11 titles? So he, he was yep. better at that. As you got older, James, were there anything that, anything that you decided to do to improve your skill set? One of the kids in our neighborhood got a weight set for Christmas. You know, the old cement weights with the plastic mm -hmm. around them. So we all started lifting weights. Now, we didn't lift on our legs. We just lifted chest and arms. And so we all thought we were Popeye. But that early weightlifting was something that kids weren't doing in the 60s. So that helped me out. And I started running every day from when I was about 11 or 12 years old all the way through college, where I ran every day. And 
I lived about what I realize now is about two miles away from the forum in Los Angeles where mm -hmm. the Lakers played. And I would jog around the forum before people were quote jogging. So I, you know, I did that all the time. And, uh, that helped me because like I said, I wasn't the best in the neighborhood, but I was driven and I didn't know I was driven. I was just a kid doing what I thought I enjoyed. So this running and this weightlifting, I started at a pretty early age. More rides with NFL Hall of Famer James Lofton after these messages. You had maybe 20, 25 kids on a Pop Warner team, right? We had seven kids off that team that made it to NFL training camps at one point or another in their career. Well, James, there's a you know unique story about your high school days. <laughs> there's a rumor floating around the universe that you had an encounter with some tough guys in your neighborhood that kind of led you to ultimately trying to go at football 110%. My high school started in the 10th grade. We didn't have ninth mm -hmm. graders or a freshman class. And we had a quad where everybody would gather in these kind of steps that kids would hang out on. So I saw the, the same guys that I grew up playing with at the park over there hanging out on the steps. So I walked towards them and they say, hey, give us your money. And I kind of laugh about it and I said, what are you guys talking about? Give us, give me your money. I, said, I don't have any money. So I reached in my pockets and pulled out both my pockets and they were empty. And, and one of the kids, I won't mention his name, kind of nailed me right in the chest with his, with his hand, you know, hit me hard enough where it hurt, but hard where it really embarrassed me, where, it, you know, you kind of well up with tears in your eyes. You don't want to fight back because this kid is so much bigger than you. But it just embarrassed me because these are the guys that I was used to hanging out with because they had been athletes at the park, but now they were non-athletes and they were end up going to be gang members. And mm -hmm. I think if they hadn't embarrassed me in front of what I considered the whole school, and there were probably, now that I think about it, maybe 20 people watching, but embarrassed me enough where I didn't want to hang out with them. I didn't want to be around them. So it's safe to say that embarrassment led to a direction of structure for you. Yes. And I was really fortunate that I had some some great high school coaches who took care of me and tried to steer me out of trouble. Your junior year, you sprouted up to 6'1", you gained some weight, 155 pounds, I think to be exact. Uh, what led to the the weight gain? A lot of peanut butter and jelly. And my dad actually bought me one of those big cartons of what it was called MLO, which was called Muscle On, which was protein and carbohydrates and all that junk in there. And you'd mix that up with milk and you enough peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, and you're going to gain some weight. Now, I was going to grow anyways, but even at 6'1", 155, I was not an imposing figure. <laughs> you started to encounter some real prolific names that would go on to be superstars in the NFL. One of your first encounters uh, came against Ricky Bell. We talked about me being, as a junior, 6'1", 155. And so I'm playing quarterback and also playing, you know, free safety. And, like, teams ran a lot. And Fremont ran out of the eye. And they had a fullback who was double zero. And they had Ricky Bell who was zero. And, and Ricky Bell at the time was probably... <laughs> the fullback had double zero and, and zero. Ricky had zero. And, and Ricky was probably 6'2", maybe 200 pounds. He might have been a couple pounds uh, heavier. But I still remember them coming directly at me. You know, the, the line just opened up. It was like Moses part in the Red Seas. And, uh -huh. and I jokingly say that I tackled Ricky as he ran over me and he tripped on my face mask. And he was just such a physical back. And Ricky Bell wasn't the only stud you played against in high school. Warren Moon, he was uh, at Alexander Hamilton High School in L.A. at the same time you you were in high school as well. How did you how did you guys match up? You got to turn the clock back even further. Warren and I were on my first Pop Warner team in 1968. Oh, so and you just you you knew Warren pretty much yes, your entire I did. life. Okay, well, and, and this team. You know, you have maybe 20, 25 kids on a Pop Warner team, right? We yep. had seven kids off that team that made it to NFL training camps at one point or another in their career. Seven? Seven. You lived in a talent, a talented area, to say the least. Like I said, I played basketball, baseball, and all that. And I was on the all-star team when I was 12 years old. I was the backup center. Our starting center didn't show up for one game, so I got to start in an all-star game. And at halftime, you know, it was maybe 14 to 12. 
and our starting center is going to get there at halftime. And so he goes in and we win the game like 40 to 18. And I'm watching him play and I'm thinking to myself, man, I must not be that good because he's just killing everybody out there. That player, <laughs> NBA All-Star, UCLA, two-time NC2A Player of the Year, Marcus Johnson, Hall of Famer. Wow. The neighborhood was pretty rich. And after playing against some of those outstanding names in high school, you had an opportunity to have a few major football programs knocking down your door. You ultimately uh, decided to sign with Stanford. Why? Stanford was the only one that was clear cut about me getting to do two sports, to be able to run track and then to play football at the same time. Because mm -hmm. I ran track the whole four years, I improved on those times. So when I left, I was 10-3 for 100 meters, 20.5 for 200 meters, sub 46 Ooh. for 400 meters, and a 27-foot long jumper. So that's where I blossomed. And if I go somewhere else and all I do is play football and lift weights, I probably don't have that speed that I had once I got to the NFL. Early on in your career at Stanford, you know, it took some time. Your, uh, your freshman year, you were on the JV team. Then after your junior season, uh, I think something that you benef benefited from was a change in the coaching staff. Exactly. Coach Bill Walsh. What actually changed when Bill Walsh came to Stanford? His first head coaching job was my senior year at Stanford. And, and he walked in, he came down, he had met with the team, and then he took an afternoon and he came down to the track. So he, he comes up to me, goes, well, who did you piss off? I, and, and you know, I just don't really know him. And I'm going, what, what do you mean? He said, how come you haven't been starting? And I go, and I, go I, I don't know. So he brought me into the office and he had some film of Isaac Curtis who had played with the Cincinnati Bengals, who was built like me. He had been a sprinter at Cal, long strider, deep ball guy. And he said, this is who you can be like in the pros. And nobody had ever said, you're going to be in the pros before. The first game of my senior year, we go on the road and we play Colorado. First game I've ever started. And I go up against Otis McKinney, who's going to be a second round pick eventually with the Raiders. My stat line was zero catches, zero yards, zero touchdowns. Bill Walsh comes in, he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he goes, don't worry about today. You'll have a game where you catch a dozen passes. And, you know, he's behind me, so he doesn't realize that I'm rolling my eyes. Yeah. Because I had caught a dozen passes all of the previous year. <laughs> Fast forward, week six, going up against Nesby Glasgow who's going to play for 10 years in the NFL. I had 12 for 192 and three touchdowns. It, it, almost, it almost makes me well up now thinking about Bill Walsh because he always or went out on the limb for me. When I look back, I could see his pattern that there are guys that he chose that he's that he said, I'm going to say something about them to the media and put them on a, in a position and in a direction where they can excel and become champions. And he did that for me. And I was just forever grateful now that I look back on it. The Rise with James Lofton will return after these messages. Bart Starr gets on the phone. He says, congratulations. We've drafted you, and you're a Green Bay Packer. James, you did everything you were supposed to do at the collegiate level at Stanford. And because of your success, you had an opportunity to have a draft night. So what was your draft night like in 1978? The draft has, has really evolved and, and grown. If, if you were to take it now, and you'd say the draft has now become Dwayne The Rock Johnson big muscles, pyrotechnics going off and all that. Well, when, yep. when I got drafted, it was just a little baby. There, there was no, you're getting invited to New York. There was no television coverage of the draft. Um, you just got a call either in your dorm room or if your apartment, 
and people would tell you you had been drafted. Um, I didn't fly out to Green Bay that day. I actually got a call early in the morning, and I remember her name. It's Carol Edwin. She says, I'm calling for Bart Starr. Can you please hold? And, you know, get a little lump in my throat. Bart Starr gets on the phone. He says, congratulations. We've drafted you, and you're a Green Bay Packer. I think he set the, the tone for the type of performance that uh, is in keeping with with a number one draft choice. He's become the premier receiver in this game, and we're extremely pleased with this new contract. Every rookie that gets drafted eventually will have a welcome to the NFL moment. So James, what was your welcome to the NFL moment? In Green Bay, we had a thing called up downs. So we do about 50 up downs. Wow. And then we go, to, we split up in a group with the receivers, go one place, the running back go somewhere else. But the receivers are doing monkey rolls. So three people where you're doing monkey rolls. And as we're going through this, and we've done the 50 up downs, I'm thinking to myself, I can't make it. I'm just exhausted. Because you're doing something that you're not used to doing, and you yeah. don't know when it's going to end. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we stop the monkey rolls, and then we just stand around, and we start walking through plays. And, and I was so worried that that was going to be the pace for the next two hours. But they wanted to tire you out first to see how you would do mentally, and then you give you a little bit of break, and then you go and you do one on one, and and then you're able to catch your breath and you're able to get into it. And who was the best player you played with and against? When you start talking about players that you play against, yes, I have respect for cornerbacks that I played against. I don't want to give them too much respect because then you're not competing against them. I got to play against, I'm looking at your jerseys behind you, got to play against Mel Blunt, got to play against Rod Woodson, mm -hmm. had 60-yard touchdowns plus against both of them. You were a long strider. And the thing that I hated about covering wide receivers like you who are long striders, they sneak up on you. And yeah, snuck up on them with those long strides and then got past them. <laughs> what about Deion Sanders, prime time? You guys ever matched up? I did play against Primetime, and what's so funny about that, he's he's in Atlanta, and the game that he came to play in Buffalo, it's cold and windy. So we probably rushed for 300 yards against them, and we've passed for maybe 100 yards. And I just remember trying to block him and him backpedaling for about 40 yards because he didn't want to be involved in the run play at the time. Wow. But I, I, will, I will tell you this, the, the best combination that I ever played against, because normally you play against a team that might have one all-pro guy and another pretty good player. But the Raiders had Mike Haynes and Lester Hayes. And Lester Hayes, to me, should be in the Hall of Fame. I think one year he had 13 interceptions, and Mike Haynes is a Hall of Famer. And you got no relief playing against these guys because either one of them could cover you one on one all across the field. And they had a great pass rush to boot. Now, the best that I played with, that's a tough one. I played with Bo Jackson. Mm. I played with Herschel Walker. I played with Marcus Allen. Three, three pretty good backs right there, three Heisman Trophy winners. But I also played with Thurman Thomas when I was with the Buffalo Bills. We had called Thurman's number on a fourth and four. And on the fourth and four, the we're, we're going to run to the right behind the right tackle. Well, the defensive end beat the right tackle across his face, slanted inside of him, hit Thurman about three yards deep in the backfield. Thurman spun off of him, ran into the outside linebacker, the Sam linebacker, got past him and picked up six yards. One of the toughest players that I've ever been around. Coming up, life after football with James Lofton. To get to be a player, a broadcaster, a coach. James, tell us the feeling that you have being inducted into Canton, into the Hall of Fame, having your son, uh, you know, present you uh, with the induction. I had asked Bart Starr about three or four years earlier, and I asked Bart, I said, if, if I get inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, would you be interested in presenting me? And he said, he said, I'd be honored, but if you have a family member, that would mean so much more to your family. So 
ended up picking my oldest son, David. About a day out, David's room was across the hall from us. I remember leaving my room once and I remember hearing his voice. And I said, what, who is he talking to? What is he doing? And I stopped outside his door and he was rehearsing his speech a little bit. When he finally got up to talk about me and about the impact that I had had to him as a dad and how he watched me do things and say things, you know, your, your, your eyes just well up instantly. He did such a tremendous job because it wasn't pre-recorded. It was on a hot afternoon in Canton, Ohio, one where you're, all, you're already sweating before you walk up to the podium. And he, he just knocked it out of the park. So it was really impressive. And it meant so much to me to look around when I got up to speak and to see high school teammates, high school coaches, college coaches, college teammates, people who had driven from different parts of the country. It was uh, truly uh, a memorable week. For the NFL part of it, it's only been 43 years. And, and that sounds crazy when I say that. But I think about the fact that when I was growing up in Los Angeles, we played football at the park, but when we didn't feel like walking to the park, we played in the street in front of my house. And I remember one tree was a first down marker, another tree was another first down marker, and then where there were two bigger bushy trees, those were the end zones. And when I say we played in the street, we're playing in the street as cars are starting to you know, go by a little bit. So. The fact that I just always loved playing football, didn't know that there was a path to me playing in the NFL until I got to college and got close. Um, and then to get to work in it so long, to get to be a player, a broadcaster, a coach, and then a broadcaster again, it has just been fantastic. This was a quality opportunity for me. I'm a fan. Uh, and, and I enjoyed this conversation. I thank you so much for joining me here on The Rise. Well, thank you for having me. And, and I am equally a fan of the game. Like I said, I watched you. I love watching the players now. And I even love watching the players that preceded me. And to be part of this game and to be linked to it, you, you can't express how much that means as a player, a coach, and a broadcaster. Thanks, James. Be sure to check in for other Rise shows and also other original programming and memorable games on Origin Sports. Thanks for joining us.